Welcome everybody, back to the bunker. This is um, this is going to be Inner Chambers, Volume Two, and uh, this is kind of a kind of an unprepared, quick episode this week. But I I just came upon this particular case, and I really just wanted to bring everyone's attention to it and just get it out there and um, just bring attention to this because uh, cause it's it's pretty crazy. And I hesitate to to tackle this one, but I just, I have to in this particular case because I mean, it breaks one of my number one rules when I started to um, the podcast and cover different issues and cases and books and so forth. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm breaking a rule of mine, and that is to say absolutely anything about Roswell because, let's face it, um, basically anything about Roswell has been said and has been done. At least that's what I thought. Until uh, I, I found out about this particular angle of the case that I had not heard of, and again, you know, we can, we can speculate on the validity of this claim back and forth. And, you know, there's, there's lots of criticisms, pluses and minuses on both sides of this. But I just, like I said, I just wanted to get this out there and, and cover this so that you can make your determination on this. Because this is something that I had not heard of. Uh, but it's, it's intriguing whether or not it's true. Um, is, is a different issue, but it's, it's very interesting and, um, has to do with Roswell, like I said, but it also has to do with Albert Einstein, which if you think about when these events took place in 1947, if, you know, you had a short list of people that you wanted to contact, had this event really taken place the way it's reported, Einstein would certainly be on that list, wouldn't he? But this, um, and I'll put the link to the website uh, where I'm getting this information uh, on the episode so that you, you can make sure that you follow up with this. You read the article yourself and you actually listen to some of the audio because there are two audio clips that are included with this report that you can listen to that were recorded back in 1993. And uh, uh, like I'll put links in, like I said, but this is a, I'm getting this from Anthony Bregalia's uh, UFO Explorations website. And the story is entitled Einstein, Einstein's Secret Trip to View UFO, Roswell UFO Revealed in Taped Confession. So when I heard about this, I was like, what? I have forgotten about my, my self-ban on Roswell material. Because like I said, it, it, there have been thousands of TV shows and interviews and podcasts and claims of, about Roswell back and forth. Yes and no. And it couldn't be true because of this. And it has to be true because of that. And, you know, there are some very prominent, very respected researchers who've tackled this and kind of, you know, beaten it into the ground, I would say, um, not by their malfeasance, but by their just, you know, in-depth reporting on this. And I just feel like there wasn't anything else that could be said about Roswell at all. Uh, but you know, this, when this story hit me, I was like, well, I have to, I have to break one of my rules. So, um, so I'll, I'll read some clips from the article. I'm not going to play the audio because, um, you know, it's about 20 something minutes altogether. There is some audio issues in the, in the quality of the audio clips. There are some, some bits and pieces missing. Um, and I have some questions and concerns about this report that I'll get to at the end, but I'll start, but just like reading some excerpts from this article and then and then we'll go from there okay so the article begins with this in a 1993 tape confession never before made public albert einstein's assistant in the summer of 1947 made the stunning admission that she and the professor were flown to roswell new mexico under government direction and examined the debris and bodies resulting from the crash of an extraterrestrial vehicle the interview of the assistant can be listened to below she later earned two phds 
at Florida universities in nearly 50 years. In the winter of her life, she felt an obligation to history to reveal, to reveal the truth. She acted on this by allowing herself to go on record and detail the trip that she and Einstein made in July of 1947 to examine a craft and crew from another world. Einstein was, of course, the most renowned theoretical physicist of the 20th century, revolutionized the science of the, of the astronomic and microscopic, microcosmic levels. Sorry. Einstein proved the existence of atoms and molecules and showed that the fabric of the universe was made of space-time. There's also a link to the assistant, Dr. Shirley Wright's uh, obituary here. So I'll just skip down here. Her, her Roswell story was originally told by the late UFO researcher Leonard Stringfield in entries in his privately published early 1990s status report UFO crash retrievals monograph series. He gave Einstein's assistant the pseudonym Edith, Simp Edith Simpson to protect her name and family's privacy. But Stringfield did mention in his book the name of the researcher in Florida who met with Dr. Wright to interview her, a woman named Sheila Franklin. Franklin was active in the state's mutual UFO network or MUFON organization. Stringfield and Franklin collaborated to document what the woman had to say. So let's get to the story. So here's Wright's Roswell story. Wright explained to Franklin that in 1947, she had been chosen from a number of gifted students to work for Professor Einstein during the summer of 1947. She had undergone extensive security and reference checks because her job would place her in a sensitive position. Einstein took a professional liking to Wright, and he took her everywhere. She recalled Einstein as warm-hearted, sympathetic, and friendly to all his students, but it was in July of that year that an event transpired that remained vividly emblazoned in her memory for life. She had accompanied him to attend a, quote, crisis conference, end quote, taking place at Southwestern Army Air Base with military and other scientists in attendance. They had flown from Princeton to Chicago on a regular flight where they took another flight to a small civilian airport. airport. It, was it was raining when they landed and a colonel in a trench coat drove them perhaps 50 to 75 miles through the desert to the base. They were taken to a heavily guarded hangar. It was there that Wright and Einstein realized they, that they were dealing with something unearthly. She described the craft stowed in the hangar. It was a disc shape, sort of concave. Its size stood up to one fourth of the hangar floor. The craft appeared in some way damaged on one side. She said that unfortunately she was not able to get close enough to see fine details as the craft was surrounded by guards, photographers, and specialists that were studying it. Wright said that the body of the ship was what I would call today a rather reflective material, but when you got up close to it, it was rather dull, she added. They were very curious about what the materials were. Franklin asked Wright what interested Einstein most. Wright replies, propulsion and more about the universe. She added, he was not disturbed at all by seeing the actual evidence. I didn't uh, record in my notes his initial comments, but he said something to the effect that he was not surprised that they come to Earth and that it gave him hope that we could learn more about the universe. Contact, he said, should be a benefit for both of our worlds. Sounds like something he would say. Franklin wondered what Wright's personal reaction to, to the viewing had been. Wright replied, my reaction was wonderment, half curiosity, and maybe half fear. But Wright and Einstein were shown something more than just a craft. Also inside the air base hangar were extraterrestrial creatures. She said of them, some of the specialists were allowed closer looks, including my boss. To me, they all looked like, they all looked alike, all but five of them. They were about five feet tall, without hair, big heads, enormous dark eyes. Their skin was gray and a slight greenish tinge, but for the most part, their bodies were not exposed, being dressed in tight-fitting suits. But I heard they had no navels or genitalia. Interesting. Later in their stay, there was another leg to their trip. She and Einstein were escorted by jeeps about 50 miles through the desert to a lone isolated building with guards at the door. Ushered into the building, they were greeted by an officer to an area where uniformed personnel and medical people were gathered around a gurney on which a creature was struggling in pain. It made unusual sounds, but never spoke. Wright herself was kept at a distance, but described it as a grayish bipedal, perhaps a bit more human than the others that she had seen previously. Its torso was grotesquely expanded, it must have been a fresh case, but I was told nothing, and before long, all of us were dismissed from the premises. Wright told Franklin that later, she had heard that the creature survived. Wright says that Einstein 
quote, who had the right clearance made a report, which I didn't see. I was just told to keep my mouth shut, unquote. So she was not made to sign any papers. She was reminded of her pledge to say nothing. Frank, Franklin recalls that Wright had mentioned that the Roswell trip would be denied, that there would be no written documentation of the trip, and that any evidence of it having ever been made would be deleted. Wright had uneasy concerns that any types, that the certain types after the event, she may have had tabs kept her in some way, including officials questioning people in her surroundings about her. Uh, which isn't surprising. Uh, there's a comment towards the end of the article about uh, attempts to, to validate these claims. Even though uh, Wright warned a paper trail of the Roswell trip would not be found, attempts were still made. The Albert Einstein archives at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the Einstein Papers Project at Caltech were both contacted to see if there was any indication of Einstein's whereabouts during the period of July 7th to the 20th, 1947 which is after the crash is stated here. Is there a calendar or schedule by chance that reflects his activities and locations? Although the chances of such documentations were very low, it needed to be addressed. The responses, the responses sometimes after great delay were varied, which is interesting. It, reply, it implies like some question. If, if he was definitely not there, you would think that the documentation would be pretty consistent and would be put forth and would kind of squash it right there. But, the fact that it's sort of wishy-washy is a little suspect, but anyway. But so I listened to these two clips of uh, the audio. One is uh, just shy of 11 minutes long, and the other one's just over eight minutes long. And uh, I did touch on before that the, the audio quality is a little sketchy. There are some some blips and stuff, and you can hear skips in the in the audio, and there's some obviously some audio missing. I'm not sure if that's on purpose or if that's just uh, from poor quality, maybe in the process of digitizing it. I'm not sure, but there, there seems to be some gaps in the audio. Um, but I, I will put the link to this site on this episode so that you can follow up. And I, it's very interesting to listen to. I, I hope that you follow up and you listen to these, you know, these clips and, draw your own conclusions. But after listening to them a couple of times this morning, I did have some concerns about some of the things that are, that she stated in the audio and some of the things that are in this report that kind of contradict certain things. So, so, so she, she indicates at one point in the audio that there was communication between the beings and some people on her team and the other scientists. And what is missing is there's, there's no detail about how exactly this communication happened, exactly who the communication went in, went to, was it stated? She, I believe she states it was not directly to her, but so, but she's not clear about how exactly that information was relayed to her, who exactly these communications were, were given to and how she became aware of these communications and she doesn't state who told her what was being said and who was communicating back and forth. That's kind of left out. Um, that's kind of problematic. That's, that's a big deal. Um, at this point, perhaps maybe at the time it didn't seem like following up. That would be an important detail. And she felt that she was coming forth and needed to say this for history's sake in her words. Um, but following up at this point, that's a problem that a lot of these gaps are, are there because you, as you try to follow up and then maybe connect some dots, there's, there's enough missing to where you could kind of really question things or draw different conclusions. So during this communication, she, the, um, the woman interviewing her, uh, Sheila Franklin, asks her if the being stated with, with their such advanced technology, how was it possible they were able to crash? What took place? What happened? And she begins to answer the question and says that they, there was some, uh, there was some kind of accident, something terrible happened and what, and that's what resulted in the crash. But she kind of moves on and uh, Sheila does not press her on that part of it. And they kind of just move on to other questions, which are equally intriguing, but I just found it, 
it kind of bothered me a little bit, just selfishly, that she didn't answer that question. She indicated, and in, in during the audio as well, that that this was not an isolated ship; that this was part of a fleet of, I believe, eight ships. She says, one of which she states crashed in Siberia. Okay, now shortly after she makes this claim, she she indicates that the beings then stated that they were unable to identify what quote unquote country Roswell was in. Like they didn't know the geographic location or what we referred to it as Roswell, New Mexico, which she states they had to relate to the beings because they obviously don't know our geography. Right. But then, so how did they, so how did the beings know what Siberia was? That's not made clear. And so that's kind of a problem. Uh, But again, there's lots of gaps in this audio. There may be many more tapes. This is only 20, maybe 30 minutes in total. Uh, with all the all the gaps filled in. but So who's to say if there are other tapes, if she did state this somewhere else, I'm not really sure if there was a follow-up interview that took place somewhere. It's very possible. But I found that kind of interesting that she stated that, you know, we had to tell them like, oh yeah, well this was United States, Roswell, New Mexico is what we call it. Um, but the being stated that another ship crashed in Siberia. So I'm not sure, did, was information relayed to the scientists and the scientists determined, oh, that was probably Siberia. Yeah, that's, it's, it's kind of glossed over and it's not gone into in depth, but I found that a little interesting. She, she also makes a claim in, in the audio about what the craft looked like on the inside and what the, some of the technology looked like and, and, and how it worked. Some of the simpler stuff, pods coming up, the devices coming up out of the floor and so forth. Um, she does state that, but she also states that she was not allowed inside the vehicle. And so she doesn't say in these two audio clips, she doesn't state how she knows that, like what other colleague relayed that information to her. I like, I understand she couldn't use names, but it's not said that, oh, well, another member of the team told me this. It's kind of just glossed. She starts describing it, but doesn't go into any detail at all about how she knows it when she was, when she clearly stated she wasn't allowed near the craft or in it. So, and she was just seeing it from a distance. So that's kind of a problem. Um, so again, there are some gaps in the audio, so this could be maybe have been addressed in some other tapes. Um, but one other thing that I found interesting, and when you listen to this, you'll probably pick up on this, is at, at no point in the audio does she say Einstein's name. She doesn't say Einstein. She says scientists, other scientists, you know, other people, other military, uniformed individuals. But at no point in this audio, again, there are gaps, but it in the audio that we're given and we're presented here, we're, she doesn't use Einstein's name. She doesn't ever say Einstein. So it could have been maybe that was just implied because obviously that at that time that was her boss and that's where she was. So maybe it was self-evident and didn't need to be stated, but it's just, you know, again, all these years later, picking it apart, this is uh, some of the problems I had with it, but still a super interesting piece of, story about Roswell and it, and it piqued my interest, which I'd kind of, you know, threw that, you know, bathwater out the window on Roswell years ago. Cause I was just not sick of hearing it, but, but I just felt that all of the best investigators had, had, uh, had tackled this, uh, multiple times inside and out. And there was nothing else that could be said about it. But this, this story came upon my attention and really it got, it, you know, I, my ears perked up and um, you know, it's interesting that it's reported that Einstein, you know, reached out to the president, you know, talked about the president's shoot down were of these crafts that were seen flying over Washington DC and warned against it. So it makes you wonder, you know, did, did, although he didn't come out and say it publicly, did Einstein know a lot more than he let on? Was he, was he really afraid that, you know, seeing some of this technology as this report claims he was worried that if we started something with these this other race um, them being so superior we would have you know been outgunned and just you know taken apart who's who's to say Uh, but it kind of fits that narrative and it's interesting that um this comes out uh at this time because like i said you know this this interview took place in 93 it appears in a book and it's a report that I was not aware of and it's, it's super interesting. So I wanted to share this with you guys. Um, actually out on the road right now, I'm in, in a, 
the Hilton Hotel <laughs> in a pretty nice suite, actually, um, uh, in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Uh, but I wanted to, but I, this report came upon me. And it's next week. I got, I'm booked up, loads of stuff to do, all kinds of research to do back and forth. But I wanted to jump on this while I had a few, few minutes and, um, and, and share this story with you because I just found it so compelling. Uh, yeah. And I, I'll put, like I said, put link to this website and this report in the, in the episode so that you guys can follow up and you can, um, take a look at this report and it may you draw your own conclusions and, you know, hopefully, you know, maybe some of you out there have some different details or different documents that may uh, prove or disprove this claim, but you know, and I'd be interested to see those, uh, interested to hear your opinions. You can, um, you can shoot me an email at mail to the bunker at gmail.com. Love to hear your thoughts uh, on this crazy report that piqued my attention on Roswell, which I had <laughs> all but given up on. So pretty cool. Um, lots of new things coming out for the bunker. I uh, recently was on the, um, that time I was abducted by aliens with Jamie and Bree. Super entertaining show, super fun, a great interview. Uh, it's a, it's a awesome show that's, uh, is on audio on many different podcatchers, but also on YouTube as well. It's a great show. Um, they really know what they're doing. Super professional job. Um, and I'll be appearing on that show again coming up soon. Um, and I have a couple of interviews I'm lining up myself for the bunker. So those will coming up. Uh, so just uh, stay tuned everybody and, uh, hope everybody has a great weekend quite wet and soggy here in Norristown today, but, uh, yeah, hope you're having a great weekend and stay weird, everybody. <laughs>